I think there is an appreciation that uh, rejoining is going to be extremely challenging. The problem is that not rejoining is going to be also extremely challenging. And in a sense, uh, they are trying to create uh, a non-existent comfort zone, which is that somehow, of course, Brexit was not ideal, it was a mistake and things, but it's not as bad as all that. We can somehow make the thing work. We can muddle through. And this is, uh, I'm afraid, um, a, a line of thinking that has a very long and not very glorious history in, in British policymaking. Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust, and I'll be discussing today with the chair of the Federal Trust, John Stevens, the state of Brexit and the Brexit debate in the United Kingdom. John, uh, at the weekend, there was a, a well-publicised report in The Observer about a meeting which had supposedly taken place between leading Conservative and Labour politicians on the subject of Brexit. Their theme was moving beyond uh, remain and leave camps uh, and trying to make Brexit work. Uh, that's been much criticised, particularly by the in most enthusiastic Brexiters who see it as a, a prelude to betraying Brexit. Um, are, are they right to have these fears? Well, they're right to be concerned that Brexit is clearly not working, and this is further proof of it. But I think they're quite mistaken in imagining that this is any form of serious attempt at reversing Brexit. Quite the contrary. It's actually uh, an indication that the Labour Party is accepting that uh, going along with Brexit and using this slogan of making Brexit work um, benefits from having some links to the Conservative Party. It improves their political strategy, which is to recover the Red Wall by avoiding essentially the Brexit issue or loading the blame for Brexit onto the Conservatives, but not addressing the underlying issue that Brexit has been a disaster. Uh, it seems that Sunak wasn't informed of this meeting. Uh, how significant is that? Well, I think it is quite surprising that he was not informed. And I think it is an indication of his weakness in this situation. I mean, he is at the moment endeavouring to get a deal on the Northern Ireland Protocol. Any form of a discussion along these lines that raises the fears of the harder line anti-Europeans uh, in the Conservative Party and beyond in the Democratic Unionist Party, uh, I think makes his position more difficult. So uh, I can't imagine he was overjoyed to read this over his um, breakfast. Um, do you attach significance to the fact that uh, apparently some uh, leavers, some people who, who voted um, uh, to leave for Brexit, um, are now admitting, at least in private, um, that Brexit isn't working. Although, interestingly, uh, Gove, who was widely quoted in, in the, the Sunday press, um, apparently still believes that Brexit was a, was a spiffingly good idea. Well, uh, Gove clearly thought it was a spiffingly good idea in order to advance his own personal political ambitions, like Boris Johnson. I mean, this is the irony of the situation that both of them almost certainly embraced the Leave campaign, not out of deep consideration or conviction, but because it was uh, part of their strategy to acquire leadership of the Conservative Party. Um, Gove, I think, is now in a very interesting position because he must know that Brexit is a disaster and that he will have a very significant responsibility for it when the history books come to be written. Now, I'm not sure whether he is someone who worries about that sort of thing, but um, if he does, the one chance he has of redeeming his position would be to now actually say that it was a mistake to do Brexit. But of course, he, he won't do that. I, I, I would be astonished if he did. It would be the one thing that could actually really change the debate in Britain would be someone like him recanting their errors. But on the contrary, it seems that he is still immured in essentially a personal position of justifying himself. And as long as that is the case, then uh, his uh, place in history will be deservedly as black as night. Is it, is it over-optimistic to think that uh, two wings are emerging within the Conservative Party and their approach to Brexit, one of which, headed by people like Jacob Rees-Mogg, is, is entirely uh, ideological and dogmatic, and the other, perhaps headed by Gove, is, um, is a more pragmatic uh, a, approach? Uh, is that over-optimistic? Is it inaccurate? Well, I, I think it is certainly true that there have been uh, 
a curious combination in the Brexit camp between true believers and opportunists and the the most effective brains in the operation and the most effective campaigners have in fact been the opportunists, not the true believers. And as the problems of Brexit mount up, clearly the ranks of the true believers will thin and the numbers of those who have to work out how they can live with the consequences of what has happened uh, will grow. Uh, as I say, Gove, and for that matter, Johnson, but Gove particularly because he is an intelligent man and I think um, is more self-aware than most others in this situation, has got an opportunity to correct the enormous error of Brexit. But I don't think he will take it because of the uh, personal restraints which he is undoubtedly under and because of the residual position of his own ambition. But uh, the the broader point is that Brexit is clearly failing and what can be saved from the wreck is now the, the main direction of debate. Why do you think it is that the Labour Party has um, participated in, in this uh, event, in these discussions? I, I can see why they might not want to talk too much about Brexit. Uh, I can even understand um, the claim of, of Starmer and others that it will be inappropriate to re-enter the single market or the customs union, uh, but to be seen to be working together with the government um, on this issue, uh, why have they gone down that road? Well, I think it is a, a manner of, of putting the blame for all the problems of Brexit onto the Conservatives, while at the same time not putting themselves into a position of actually addressing those problems and reversing it. I mean, it is, in a sense, a, an, an ideal um, political position to be in, in the, ahead of the general election if their target is indeed uh, winning back the red wall seats which they lost in 2019. So it is purely tactical, but it has a tactical merit in the sense that it is uh, um, asymmetric from the point of view of the Conservative Party. It weakens the Conservative Party's credibility as a Brexit party. It makes it more difficult for the Conservatives to retreat into a, a an attempt to recreate the 2019 campaign by firing up the Brexit issue and proclaiming its benefits and its liberating, supposedly liberating qualities. Um, and it, it, so it therefore traps the Conservative Party. And I think that's pr principally what Starmer is, is considering. And his um, it has a, a quality of uh, Peter Mandelson's tactics, actually, which is, and of course, he was attending the Ditchley. He was apparently event. attending that. Um, Many people on the Remain side of the argument uh, have welcomed uh, this meeting, um, seeing it as being a, a beginning of a, a more um, conciliatory and a constructive approach to Brexit. Um, are they right uh, in their evaluation? Well, I think there is certainly going to be an attempt uh, to uh, say that we've got to make the best of a bad job. I mean, this is clearly the the, the emerging mainstream consensus, both um, in the Labour Party's position. Um, and I think more widely, because I think there is an appreciation that uh, rejoining is going to be extremely challenging. The problem is that not rejoining is going to be also extremely challenging. And in a sense, uh, they are trying to create uh, a non-existent comfort zone, which is that somehow of course, Brexit was not ideal. It was a mistake and things, but it's not as bad as all that. We can somehow make the thing work. We can muddle through. And this is, uh, I'm afraid, um, a, a line of thinking that has a very long and not very glorious history in, in British policymaking. Um, do, do you think that that will be a sustainable position for the Labour Party in particular over the next couple of years? If the situation becomes much worse, if opinion turns much more vehemently against Brexit, uh, will the Labour Party be able to continue with this, uh, this uh, pay playing both ends against the middle? I think if the economic situation deteriorates further, it will become more difficult. That's certainly true. But the, the problem is that there is no strategy to actually rejoin. And there is no honesty about what rejoining would really entail. And as long as that is the case, as long as there is no one willing to make a positive case for rejoining and a positive case for the European Union overall, then uh, this halfway house of hoping that somehow we can muddle through 
will, I fear, prevail. One of the issues that will certainly have been discussed at this meeting would have been um, Northern Ireland and the Northern Ireland Protocol, where it seems that the Labour Party are are willing, once again, in a slightly uh, um, disingenuous way to help the government um, um, uh, solve the problems which um, which they're confronted with. Um, uh, we are told that there is uh, a text of the protocol, revised protocol, modified folk protocol, uh, which Sunak is, is sitting on. Um, what do you think the prospects are for an agreement? And do you think he can sell it in particular to the different wings of the Conservative Party? I think he may be able to sell it to uh, the Brexiteer element in the Conservative Party. I cannot see how he can square it with unionism in Northern Ireland. And I think that's where the real barrier lies. And so even if there were to be an agreement of some kind between the EU and the UK government, whether it would actually be able to work on the ground and whether it would be consistent with uh, a restoration of Stormont, I think is a, a very different question. I mean, fundamentally, there is no solution to the to the Northern Irish situation following Brexit, um, other than ultimately uh, reunification. And this truth, with all that it entails, which are immense difficulties in Northern Ireland, um, cannot be wished away. And so all parties in this are regarding it as in some way um, just a damage limitation exercise. And I think the Labour Party's engagement is knowing that this thing is not going to work fundamentally and not wishing to have any um, responsibility for it not working, to load that responsibility entirely onto the government. In a sense, it's a specific version of why they're happy to engage with the Conservative Party in discussing uh, how Brexit might be improved somewhat. Um, It loads all the blame onto the government um, and allows them to avoid blame for not being more engaged. Mm. There is a a feedback, however, between the ERG and the DUP, isn't there? Uh, If the DUP won't buy it, I think it will be very difficult for Sunak to to sell it to the ERG. There's a, a similarity of culture, isn't there? Both... ERG and the um, and the DUP are, are waiting to be betrayed by the British government, if you like. I think that's certainly true, but there there, are, there is one very big difference, which is the DUP are concerned about the unionist tradition in Northern Ireland the, and their existential position, whereas the ERG element, I think, are, are confused with other issues that uh, will enter into their considerations. Above all, the question of whether. Boris Johnson might stage a return. And so this is much more linked, I think, in uh, the uh, British end of the of the debate um, with other considerations about the future of the Conservative Party, how it goes into the next general election, um, Johnson's return, uh, the future status of trussite economics and all the rest. I mean, uh, and Northern Ireland is only one small component of that, and one which has been consistently used by these parties um, for their own purposes, uh, most spectacularly, Johnson's own betrayal of uh, mm. the Northern Ireland doing the deal in the first place, whereas the DUP are in a totally different position. They are playing, they believe they are playing for their entire identity. Mm. Well, you say betrayal of the Northern Irish. Um, not everybody in Northern Ireland feels themselves betrayed by the protocol. Well, there is a sect, I The betrayal by the, the, the unionist tradition in Northern Ireland is obviously... Yeah, right. yeah sure. Um, something that the uh, meeting last week can't have discussed, uh, unless they had telepathic powers, um, would have been uh, the resignation of Nicola Sturgeon as First Minister in Scotland. Um, p- perhaps are equally important for the future of the Union to the question of Northern Ireland. Um, what do you think they, they might and should have said about that if they'd known about it? What implications does this have, if any, for Brexit? Well, there does seem to be a very widespread belief that the departure of Nicola Sturgeon is a defeat for uh, independence and a defeat for the SNP and has weakened significantly the SNP's position. I'm not sure that's entirely true. Nicola Sturgeon represented a an evasion of some of the fundamental truths about independence, which is, in a sense, also the evasion that uh, far too many 
pro-Europeans are now making about uh, reversing Brexit, that uh, for independence to work, Scotland has to leave the UK and join the EU. And joining the EU is a very complicated proposition, not least in matters such as the currency and the rest. And Sturgeon, I think, was um, hoping uh, to carry the issue of independence on an emotional tide, essentially, on her personality, on uh, a range of of uh, attitudes and feelings which evaded some of the very tough economic issues that independence entails. And the question really is whether her departure will force the SNP to address the issue of essentially joining the EU, which is the only plausible alternative to remaining in the UK. And so that's going to be uh, the test, I think, um, of of the significance of her departure. I think she was, in some respects, and perhaps she was aware of this, um, a barrier to the independence cause, because precisely she represented a type of nationalism that was about emotion, about uh, um, a range of, of feelings, and not addressing really tough issues. And of course, that can also be said, I think, for her conduct as first minister in Scotland, that um, despite the wave of popularity that she was able to, to, to ride, one which um, most other politicians would have been jealous of, the actual record of the Scottish devolved government in a number of key areas, the National Health Service, for example, um, education too, um, has been, in fact, rather poor. Well, it's always suspicious when the... Um, Eurosceptic press is unanimous in thinking that something has happened which enormously strengthens the hand of um, the Eurosceptics. We're always being told the, um, the European Union is about to about to fade away, um, about to be divided, um, that uh, there's a, a no future for France, Italy, Germany, whichever happens to be the unpopular country of the moment. Uh, it seems to me very premature to say that her retirement uh, from first being first minister is the end of the independence um, in, 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 in Scotland. If if this is a, a project which has legs, if it's a real shot on the board, then it will survive the, um, uh, the not even the disappearance uh, of a particular person, because uh, as I understand it, she's going to be continuing uh, in her political work. And, and it might even be that um, freed of responsibility, she will be more effective than, than she's been un, until now. Well, we've um, had a very interesting uh, review of where we are in the Brexit process. Thank you very much, John. Um, no doubt there will be many more episodes to come in future weeks and months. Goodbye.